In 1891, Mark Twain traveled to the sleepy town of Bayreuth in the south of Germany to report on an extraordinary cultural event, a festival dedicated to the operas of Richard Wagner, who died in 1883. Each summer, audiences made the pilgrimage there from around the world in earnest reverence. These devotees, Twain wrote, come the, from the very ends of the earth to worship their prophet in his own Kaaba, in his own Mecca. Though Twain was himself ambivalent about Wagner's music, especially the singing, he was deeply impressed by this atmosphere of worshipful devotion. What created this atmosphere, above all, was that it was there that Wagner had built an opera house expressly for his own works, the Bayreuth Festspiel House. And only there, Wagner's last opera, Parsifal, could be seen. This opera, which had premiered in 1882, is a gigantic epic of the legend of the Holy Grail. In the most bizarre way, it follows the adventures of a beautiful young boy who arrives at the kingdom of the knights who guard the Grail. There, things are not quite right. Their king, Amfortus, was seduced in the middle of a battle by an immortal witch. While they copulated beside the battlefield, an evil magician stole his holy lance and stabbed him in the side. The wound will not heal, and the magical realm begins to decline spiritually and eventually to die away. Parsifal accomplishes a number of deeds that, for reasons that have always been obscure, even to Wagner, set everything right. The premiere of Parsifal was Wagner's final realization of his theory of the Gesamtkunstwerk, or total work of art. He'd first developed this theory in 1849 as an ideal art form in which many artistic forces would seem, be seamlessly integrated and in this way, redeem the alienated condition of the modern world. It was not until much later that Wagner was able to try to bring it about. In the same year that he developed the theory, he began to conceive of an opera in which he would realize its ideal. In 1876, the work was finally completed in the opera cycle, The Ring of the Nibelung. It was a tremendous feat. Wagner had written the libretto, and music, directed the singers, guided the design of the stage sets, costumes, and of the Festspiel House, his opera house. This theater extended the ambition for control over the arts to complete control over the audience. The design of its auditorium was calculated so that the audience's viewing experience could be concentrated on the stage. The orchestra was sunken below a hood so that it could not be seen, and by removing that obstruction from the sightline of the audience and slightly elevating their seats, everyone had a direct view of the stage. The dark, empty space between the stage and the audience was framed by two proscenium arches and called the mystical abyss. Wagner argued that by these means, the distractions of modernity could no longer intrude in the audience's attention and they could be fully absorbed into the picture on stage, which would appear to float as a picture removed, he wrote, quote, as if to the unapproachable world of dreams. Parsifal premiered at the Festival House in 1882. For this production, Wagner was able to produce a more integrated stage work than he ever had, even for the ring. To exercise the fullest possible control, he employed an amateur painter named Paul von Zhukovsky, who had never designed for the stage. He hoped that by hiring an amateur, he would be able to create a new staging style unconstrained by the conventions of tradition. He was also able to intervene more directly in a more heavy-handed way in the design process and made Zhukovsky redesign the sets repeatedly. Wagner even applied his own artistic genius to some of the designs himself, as in this headdress for the Grail Knights. The reason that Wagner was so determined to control the production was that the Gesamtkunstwerk was always intended to change the world. Before Parsifal premiered, he published a series of articles to explain the work's meaning. Never adverse to making megalomaniacal claims for his own art, he conditioned his audience to anticipate a work that would be the basis of a new art religion. And this would catalyze a new epoch of spiritual consciousness. The stage sets that Wagner guided Zhukovsky to design created a suitable space in which the moral and spiritual drama would unfold, enveloping the audience into the ceremonial space. 
This is concentrated in the set design for the Temple of the Grail Knights, where the Grail was unveiled. The Feshpil House had been designed to lead the audience's eyes to the stage, assisted by means of a succession of lateral columns throughout the auditorium. <clears throat> the Grail Temple set carried this arrangement onto the stage, where these columns join the colonnade of the Grail Temple. In this way, the audience was notionally included in the Grail community for the great ceremony. An ingenious technical solution was found to create the sense that the realm of the Grail was one contiguous, unified, tangible space. The first act opens in a glade. The second moves to the Grail Temple. Wagner was determined that the transition between them should take place completely on the stage. And in order to achieve this, he employed an elaborate system of scrolling panoramas, which allowed the scene to transition from the forest, out of the woods, through ominous caves and into the Grail Temple without dropping the curtain. This stage magic, accompanied by the opera's sublime music, was intended to give Parsifal its religious gravity. And as Twain found in 1891, this is how many of Parsifal's audience were prepared to take it. But this is not the whole work. Act two begins in a tower of the magician Klingsor's ruined castle. He had once hoped to join the Grail Knights to, and to make himself sufficiently holy, he purified himself of lust by castrating himself. Alas, he was denied entry and is now determined to destroy the Grail Knights. Klingsor's realm is a ruined tower in the corner of a dilapidated castle strewn with ma magical apparatus, a Manichaean pendant to the orderly grandeur of the Grail Temple. Then, partway through the second scene, the stage directions call for Klingsor's castle to suddenly sink into the ground and for the next scene immediately to spring up without lowering the curtain. It is an anti-illusionistic effect completely out of place and in fact is unique in all of Wagner's mature operas. The garden that sprang up was Klingsor's magic garden, which was equally out of place in uh, Parsifal's pictorial world. The stage was now filled with lush tropical plants. Immediately, groups of young women rush on the stage in confusion, dress almost preposterously as flowers, and begin to comically bicker amongst themselves, competing for Parsifal's affection. The transition between these two scenes was sufficiently arresting to disturb less sympathetic audience members. When Virginia Woolf saw Parsifal in 1919, she complained that, quote, the change from the Temple of the Grail to the Magic Garden with its swarms of flowers, flower maidens, and red hot blossoms is too violent a break to be bridged conveniently. The break was surely violent, but it's not being easily bridged was purposeful. When the scene changed from Klingsor's castle to the garden outside the wall, the imaginary world in which the opera takes place shifts from the mysterious European Middle Ages to a decidedly modern site of European spectacle. The magic garden scene is constructed out of a series of specifically Orientalist tropes that were ubiquitous in European culture. The construction of a mysterious East had existed since antiquity, but in the 19th century, through the globalizing processes of imperialism, plunder, extraction, and trade, Europe was absolutely awash with objects, plants, and materials from everywhere throughout the world. And this gave rise to a truly popular Orientalism present everywhere. <clears throat> the association between the Magic Garden and this mysterious Orient is made immediately. The stage direction describes the garden as flanked by terraces in Arabischen Reichsstilis, a rich Arabian style. This appears in all the preparatory materials for the scene, as well as the pho photographs of the set, and is hidden in the background there. The visual association with Arabia is reinforced when, shortly later, the witch Kundri returns to the stage, reclining on a divan. In the first act, she was dressed in snake skins and rags. Now she's costumed in a ground, gown covered in jeweled bands, described in the libretto as fantastical clothing, this time almost Arabic in style. The densely foliated stage set itself evokes a similarly vague sense of the non-European world. 
Rather than the natural world itself, it resembles more closely 19th century collections of exotic plants, particularly greenhouses, which were built to display collections of tropical plants, especially ferns, that could not grow in Northern Europe. And since the acquisition of these plants was facil facilitated by imperial trade networks, greenhouses were made in Orientalist styles. In fact, while composing the music for Possipal, Wagner himself was engaged in designing a greenhouse for his Bayreuth villa, which his wife Cosima described in her diary as Arabian style, but he decided not to go ahead with it later that day. He was a capricious fellow. Long before Parsifal, the Magic Garden synthesis of elements had been painted by Karl Blegen. In the early 1830s, he had been commissioned to paint the Fauen in Selgart greenhouse in Potsdam. This greenhouse, though vaguely Moorish in style, does not pretend to be the Orient. Instead, it is a world that revels, revels in the pleasure of the exotic as property. Heating grates are depicted in the foreground to underscore the technological intervention that has been made to make the plants grow there. Finally, so there could be no question that what is being pictured is a possession fantasy, Blakin inserted a harem scene, which kind of been there. In Parsifal, the flower maidens serve the same role as these harem scenes. Because their only purpose is seduction, after which they leave the stage and don't return, they too convey that this is a fantasy world of possession rooted in Orientalist visual culture, in which everything is collected together to be owned, displayed, and consumed. And in fact, Parsifal is like this too. Beneath its heavy veil of Christian mysticism, the opera is full of ideas taken from Orientalist literature. To construct the plot, Wagner reduced the enormous sprawling medieval epic Grail literature to a few key significant episodes. At the end of the Magic Garden scene, Parsifal resists the flower maidens and Kundri seductions. Klingsor, the magician, then reappears on stage and casts a spear at Parsifal, but the spear hovers in the air above him and is able to retrieve it. This scene has no precedent in the medieval literature. It was transcribed into the Grail story from an episode Wagner took from the life of the Buddha. When he was about to attain supreme enlightenment meditate, meditating under the Bodhi tree, the demon Mara sent his daughters to seduce him. When they failed, Mara cast a discus at the Buddha, but it hung in the air over his head, the literature says, like a dry leaf or a canopy of flowers. However, as the frankly gauche orientalism of the magic garden suggests, however much Wagner might have idealized the philosophy of Buddhism, when he wrote foreign ideas into his operas, the material is always pressed into the service of his artistic project. When preparing Parsifal, he wrote to a friend that he discovered an Arabic etymology for Parsifal's name, Fal Parsi, meaning pure fool. And when he was advised that there was no factual basis for his proposal, he retaliated that, quote, I wanted to attribute the word to some dialect or other because it suits me to do so. I scoff at the actual meaning of Arab Arabian words. <laughs> the Orientalism of the Magic Garden, as well as Wagner's blithe indifference to the cultural specificity of his material, secures Parsifal's context in European attitudes towards the world that Western empires and processes of capital were then reshaping. It is this that invites a reconsideration of the Gesamtkunstwerk project. When Wagner first published his theory in 1849, he did so in the wake of a failed revolution in Dresden in which he'd participated, and he was writing in exile in Switzerland. The art form he imagined was essentially communist, to arise in a future society in which private property had been abolished. Because the modern nation state was considered a corruption of modernity, it would be abolished too, and replaced by a single international community. The Gesamtkunstwerk would then be taken up globally, and the whole human fraternity would be reconciled. Those of you who know much, or even a little about Wagner, may suspect a galling insincerity in this dream of the reconciliation of humanity. Wagner was notoriously racist, and in particular, hideously anti-Semitic. Soon after proposing the global work of art, he published a pamphlet arguing that Jewish venality had destroyed the modern world and modern art, and worst of all, that Jews were in fact physiognomically incapable of producing real music. 
This is only the ugliest of a general preoccupation with race that runs throughout Wagner's entire comprehension of the world. It is in fact present at the beginning of the history of the Gesamtkunstwerk idea. The theory was based on an impl implicitly imperialist logic. Wagner considered it possible in the 19th century only because the European exploration of the globe had prepared the field for a global artwork. This could now be imposed on and replace all the cultures of the earth. The Gesamtkunstwerk seen in this way is a product of the age of empires. To return now, finally, to where we began, this context also eliminates the spiritual meaning Wagner imputed to Parsifal. The articles in which he outlined the spiritual renewal affected by the opera became increasingly pessimistic towards its production. In 1881, while preparing the stage sets for performance, Wagner became particularly consumed by the idea that the human race was in a state of terminal decline caused by widespread miscegenation, the interbreeding between human races. Since this decline was inevitable, the lofty purpose Wagner imagined for Parsifal became diminished. It would now only provide spiritual relief during the apocalypse. Four months before Parsifal premiered, he said, quote, we shall perish, that is certain. The question now is whether we should el shall end it with holy communion or croak in the gutter. This reveals completely the imperialist basis of the Gesamtkunstwerk, since Wagner believed now that it could not survive the prospect of a globalized humanity at all. The idea always required that the people of the earth would be united, but this was belied by Wagner's convi conviction of racial inequality. Thank you.